One thing I need to explain to you this very moment is why we take off our shoes, right? Because we are walking into a place, obviously, which is regarded as a holy place and a place of purity, and we do not want any debt coming in. We could have stepped on, you know, who knows what, okay, on our way coming here. So one of the best things to do is that we take off our shoes, and it's because also there is a practice that we do in this area known as ablution. It's called wudu. What is it called? Oh, wow, lovely. You only heard it once and you said it correctly. Cool. So this is where we wash our hands, we clean our mouths, clean our noses, wash our faces, wash our arms to the elbow, a wipe, we like anoint ourselves with the water, like a wipe over the head. It's called Basah. That is why we call Jesus Al-Masih, you know, the anointed one, because of anointing, obviously. And we wash our feet. Obviously, you can do this elsewhere as well. You just need normal clean water, natural water, you can use that. And that's basically where it starts, right? So before you go through, then you'll come. I'll show you around basically where the water is coming from or anything of that sort. And by the way, there's fish in the pond here. The fish has no significance whatsoever. It just happens to make this place look very nice, okay? What we'll do is we'll walk around it. As you'll see, you'll notice the taps. That's where we use, we use the water from the taps. Now I want to tell you a little bit of a funny story. One guy from New Zealand, he came through, we were taking a tour, quite a very tall fella too, and now he wanted to basically experience the whole action, right? So when he got to the part where he's supposed to wash his feet, and then he started dipping his feet where the fish is, because he thought that's where we actually put the fish. <laughs> so no, unfortunately no, that water is for the fish, the one we use comes out from the taps, okay? Okay, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, we perform ablution. What did we say the term for it was? For anyone who remembers? Yeah, okay. It's wudu. It's called wudu, okay? So after that, obviously, the reason why we do that is because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's one of the practices he showed that before you pray, before you perform the prayers, this is what you essentially have to observe, okay? So what you have over here are dummy clocks. These dummy clocks they tell you the time that the mosque is open for congregational prayer. So our prayers are fundamentally very congregational, although you can also do them individually if ever you have to, okay? So then what you have is the mosque will have a call to prayer known as the Adhan. It will go off. I'm sure you might have heard it somewhere. You know the guy who's shouting so loud and whatnot, you don't even know what he's saying, but it sounds nice too, eh? Some people, they make it sound really nice, so. Okay, so what happens is, whenever a prayer time comes, about 10 to 15 minutes before the prayer actually sets in, or when it sets in, he's going to make the call to prayer. This is what you find if you go to, like, you know, traditional churches, you had the bell, you know, all of that action. And in a synagogue, you'd have, like, some trumpet being blown or anything of that sort. For us, we do something known as the adhan. Adhan is the call to prayer, Okay. Then what you see over here would be the time where the congregation will begin the prayer. You have one person who's leading the prayer, which we're going to try and demonstrate for you. And this person is called the Imam. So I've given you three foreign words to you today. I gave you wudu, right? What we said wudu was? It's the washing, you know that. And then we said the adhan. What did we call the adhan? What we said is that? What? Yes? The call to prayer, okay? The adhan is the call to prayer. Are we all together on this one? Yeah. Fellas, are we all together on this one? Seems like we're not. Are we all together on this? Okay, cool. And then we say the person who leads the prayers is called imam. What is he called? Imam. Not the mum or the mummy, right? It's imam, okay? Cool. So we pray five times a day. How many times? Five. five. So the first prayer would be the dawn prayer, the prayer which you perform at dawn, before sunrise. I don't have to tell you the name because you're going to forget it anyways. I want you to keep the three words I taught you already, okay? So this prayer is going to be performed perform before the sun rises. Now, a prayer is not a particular minute on the clock like how you see over there, but it's an interval, okay? So it's going to be the break of dawn all the way until the sun rises. This is the time where the prayer can be performed, okay? Then the sun will rise to the zenith point and it has to pass the zenith point. Slightly, once it passes the zenith point, then we have the second prayer. 
This would be this prayer over here, which is, uh, I would say, the early uh, noon prayer or the early forenoon, okay? This one as well is going to last as long as your shadow that is casted because of the position of the sun is either shorter than your height or equivalent to your height, okay? This is the interval. Once the, your shadow, if you're standing in the sun, is a bit taller than your height, then it's the time for the third prayer, which is this prayer over here, okay? This will be the late afternoon prayer before sunset. And this one is going to go all the way until the sun starts setting. Then it cuts off from there. The sun has to set completely immediately after sunset. You have the fourth prayer, which is this one over here. Are we all together? I think there's some chit chats though. Okay? Right. Then after that, once the sun sets, usually there's that reddish on the horizon, right? It lasts for a couple of uh, minutes. Once that is gone and then you can actually see the night coming through, then that prayer is gone. Then you have the time for the fifth prayer. This is the last one, which will be this one known as Isha. I'm sure right now some of you are curious about the other clock, isn't it? Because I only told you about the five. So it's not an additional prayer time, but it's specifically a time for the Friday sermon. So on Friday, we have a sermon during the time of the second prayer, which we said happens once the sun passes the zenith. So we have the imam who's going to obviously give some kind of a lecture or some kind of a sermon. And so this time is particularly for that. He's going to do the sermon. And if you notice, like about, I would say, 15 minutes from this time, it goes to the same time, isn't it? So to show it's actually the same time frame, except that the other portion of it is for the sermon. So it's not an additional prayer, but it's the same prayer, except that on a Friday, it's accompanied with a... It's accompanied by what? A sermon that is given. Okay. All right, come inside. Okay, the gents this side, the ladies this side. Okay. You can sit, by the way. Okay, so what I've just done... I've typically implemented what usually happens in a mosque where the seating between the men and women is separate. For obvious reasons, if you would ask the guys, maybe the girls might not get it too early, right? Because they don't necessarily get distracted by the men. It's usually the men distracted by the ladies, okay? Right, guys? Or oh, you don't want to admit it, eh? You want to keep it your secret? Sorry for exposing it. Okay, so what we then have over here is, before I go to that, the mosque, initially, it was in the 1800s where someone actually donated a piece of land so that it can be dedicated for the mosque. So it is as old as like, uh, it's over like uh, what you call about 100, 100 plus years. Obviously, it wasn't this big. It got expanded from time to time. And I think the major renovation happened around 1957. Now, one of the interesting things, if you may notice, when we were walking outside, there was a lot of noise going on, isn't it? The taxis hooting, buses with honking, and all of that. But what have you noticed? The slight difference is that when you come inside here, you can really hear a pin drop, or you can actually even hear your own thoughts, correct? And this is the beauty of a mosque. The mosque has a sense of, you know, that peacefulness you're supposed to actually feel when you're coming through. And when you're coming through the mosque, you understand you're a guest of the Creator. And so definitely behavior as well has to show that you're someone who understands that you are not just visiting every other Tom, Dick and Harry, but rather you're visiting the Creator of the entire universe. And hence, we can, the mosque will not accommodate any chaos whatsoever, right? For children, yes, it can, because children, you cannot control those, right? They're like usually all over the place and running around and it's quite nice and cute. But it wouldn't be cute for a guy like my age, busy running around and poking people and pulling them by their, you know, their headgear, whatever the case is. You understand? And so this is one of the beautiful things that you will find in the mosque. And so over here, then what we then do is we have prayers that take place. This is the main thing for the masjid. Other things do happen. A mosque is supposed to be a community center where all the community matters can actually be brought to the, the precincts of it and discussed and engaged on, okay? So what I want to do with you guys is to demonstrate to you and explain to you the prayer itself because I explained to you how to prepare for the prayer, isn't it? After you had the call to prayer, isn't it? So you come through and you prepare. 
Have you noticed that on the floor, there's some kind of a pattern that is followed? You see the design? It's not only for beautification, although it looks nice. But you have these lines, especially the, the yellow line on each, on each row. This is the one that basically dictates who stands where and what kind of a sequence they must follow. Because these prayers are formal, so they have a format as well as they have a focal direction that they face, which is this direction. Okay, so this is the direction which is like southeast, uh, if you're in South Africa. This is the direction towards Mecca. Direction towards what? Mecca, which is in what country today? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Okay, right. So now what you then have, what did we say the person who leads the prayer is called? Huh? The name of the person who leads the, the prayer? Come again. Say that. We're very close, by the way. Imam. Imam, yes. You only had one M missing, right? So the Imam will obviously stand over here, if not over there. And then everyone else who prays behind him, they will stand in these rows, okay? So we typically have these rows to occupy. So you have the Imam in front of us, and then us who pray behind him, we're going to form a row all the way to that end and all the way to the other end. Once this one is complete, then the next row starts, okay? Goes all the way like that, and all the way like that, okay? So it depends as well between the women and men how the mosque has been set up in terms of, you know, changing, or I mean facilitating the issue of separation between the two genders, okay? For example, in one mosque you might have two floors, one for the men, one for the women. In one mosque you could have actually one floor, one piece of, uh, one space, but it has maybe some kind of a curtain or some kind of a barrier so that the men are this side and the women are that side, okay? Or else you can have like what we have right over here where they have a whole separate building that is dedicated for the women. And so obviously we won't see it because of these walls, right? There's another one right that side. I can see everyone is trying to check it, <laughs> okay? Then also the traditional way or the ancient way uh, it used to be done, you'd be the imam, typically a male figure, and then you have men behind him. Once they complete those rows, then you can have, like, obviously, young kids, if they are there. And then after that, you can have the ladies subsequently, like that. Okay? Why? Because one other aspect of our prayers, we don't close our eyes, typically. Right? We don't go, Lord. No, we don't. So we're basically, like, quite aware of what's going on with our surrounding. Because there's a lot of positions that we have to observe, like when we bow, when we prostrate. You don't want to be prostrating on a uh, torrential of spina, right? So you want to be actually watching that. Okay, so I want to have uh, volunteers, which I'm going to pick anyways. You guys come, stand up. Okay, observe this row over here, stand on it. Yeah, that one is. So you see your, the yellow line, this is where your heels are at to show that you're in a straight line, okay? Right. Come closer to him. This is another important thing. Shoulder to shoulder. Uh, anyone played rugby or uh, but football, isn't it? Yeah? You know this stuff, right? Yeah. This is how we do it in the mosque, okay? So what you have now, you have people who are observing the prayer and the imam would be myself right in front, okay? So it's required that whenever you are in the prayer, you stand shoulder to shoulder like this. In unification, in uniform, because we said this is a formal thing, so it has a format and a, a, a whole a shebang going on, okay? Now look at this. He could be the most wealthiest guy, like filthy rich, you understand? And he could be the poorest guy ever, who probably they wouldn't even meet for any reason whatsoever if they were outside. But when they're in the mosque, they leave their pride and their status with their shoes outside. So you cannot say, ah, ah buddy, you can't stand. This, is, this jacket right here, it costs, I, I'd buy you and your family with the, the amount of this. You understand? It doesn't work in the mosque. So they are all the same. They are all equal, standing on the same equal footing. Even if this guy's father paid for this or donated, like I told you, this, the land to build this mosque was donated. He say, my father donated this, so I'm going to stand wherever I want. It doesn't work like that. If he comes early, for example, the imam is here. This is the best place they can be, which is right next to the imam. Okay? And then so on and so forth. Right? This is when it comes to 
the blessings of the prayer itself. But now, what is interesting is, they could have a quarrel from outside as well. This one stepped on his foot, and he never said, I'm sorry, because obviously he's, he's a big dog, right? He has everything he wants. He doesn't need this guy. So even if I could step on both of his feet, it wouldn't mean anything to him, okay? But when they're here, they cannot bring that rivalry and all those issues, okay? Because now we are all guests of the creator, one who's greater than each and every one of us. You get my point? So then what we do is, you have the imam showing us every position. Excuse me. So the imam is going to typically face this direction. So I'm going to face you guys so you can see what he does, okay? I'm just going to tell you, but this is the direction he's going to be facing. So the first thing he does is, he raises his hands with his palms facing the direction of Mecca, obviously, like this, towards the level of his shoulder or towards the level of his ears, like that. Then he says, Allahu Akbar, which means God is greater, meaning greater than everything, greater than anyone, okay? This is what Allahu Akbar means, by the way. It doesn't mean kill this guy or shoot him, whatever. Like how you see the crazy guys, they show you on videos most of the times, right? So he's going to say, Allahu Akbar, then they fold. So let's do it, guys. We say, Allahu Akbar, then we fold like this. Let, let me see the hands. This is like, when, when a person is pointing a gun at you, this is the move, isn't it? To show you submit. This is what we do. We start like this. We say, Allahu Akbar, then we fold our arms like that. With the right above the left. So you can see now, this is a uniform. It's like an army right now, okay? So then after that, the imam is going to recite some verses of the Quran, which typically goes as, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyaka na'abudu wa Iyaka nasta'een, Ihdina al-Surat al-Mustaqeem, Surat al-Ladhina an'amta alayhim, Ghayri al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhalin. Which means, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, all praises and thanks are due to Allah, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the most generous, the most merciful, the master of the day of judgment. And we say, you alone we worship, and from you alone we seek our assistance and help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those who end your mercy, and not the path of those who end your anger, or those who went astray. So those who are praying behind the imam after he recites that, they will say, Amin, which is typically Amen, right? Like how you say Amen to a prayer, right? So we say Amin. Have a little bit of a nice zing to it. You know, we prolong some of the vowels there. Okay? Right. You can, you can see for now, but I want you to be here. Okay? Cool, guys. You can have a seat, but I want you to be here. Okay, so then what happens is, the imam is going to recite other portions of the Quran. Whatever section he knows by heart. Because this is typically what Muslims do. They memorize their scripture. Cover to cover some of them. We have like thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Actually, we can go up to about millions because we are about 1.8 1, 1. billion right now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around there of Muslims. So this is a tradition. We memorize the Quran. We recite it every time we pray. So we always have our scripture in our minds and we're reciting it. And this is very interesting when it comes to, you know, preserving the message of Islam. So then he's going to recite that. Then after that, he's going to say again, the famous phrase, Allahu Akbar, right? Then now we all bow like this, okay? And we have some prayers we say while we are bowing. Now, do you remember what I mentioned about the fact that we don't close our eyes and hence we, we divide between the men and women, right? If the ladies were to pray in front of the guys, do you think the guys would have completed their prayers by that time? Because they'd be worried about the ladies behind the one who's in front of him. Correct? Say, okay, yeah, no. Say, no, her behind is great. Supposed to say, God is great, and then now you are, fant if I, I mean, fantasizing about other things. You see the point? You get it? That's why I said the guys, they, they are being quiet about it. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the wisdom. Obviously, the purpose is that this is how it was taught. If anything, even if there was no known wisdom of why, because the Creator knows us why He created us in this fashion, where He made men impressed by women and women impressed by what the men say you know that's why women wear makeup and men lie a lot you know we like what we see they like what they hear so if you have good, good tongue you know silver tongue then you have your way with the ladies don't try it though get married okay 
So now what you then have is you have one unit. So after he, we, we were bowing like this, then we also rise up. We say certain prayers as well. Every position has something to be said, okay? Then we also prostrate like this, okay? We do it twice as much, okay? Now, once again, it goes back to the point of why you have to moderate between men and women because obviously if there was a lady praying next to him, He'd probably don't go down that fast, you know. You'd wait for it to go down first to prostration, you know, just to be sure, you know, she's prostrating right, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so then what you have is you have one unit. So our prayers, the ones we mentioned, five of them, they have units. The first one has two, the second one has four, the third one has four as well, the fourth one has three. You don't have to memorize the numbers, I'm just going, you know, with the flow. And then the fifth one has four units. So you have about 17 units of prayer that I must to fulfill as a Muslim. Okay? So you fulfill these every day. And typically these prayers, they take about five to seven, ten minutes. Each one of them. So that's why they are not like a big deal uh, in that sense. Okay? Even if, you know, you think, hey, five prayers, this is too much. I can barely make two in a day. You know? Some people are like that. So in any case... Because they are formal, they have a format, they are really not a big deal once you know how to do them, you understand? So you can always perform them whenever their time is right, okay? But I want to take you back. Before you do that, there are main things in Islam that are a priority. To recognize the right of the creator, that he, since he is alone as a creator, the sustainer, and the, you know, the one who is in charge of the entire universe, so him alone deserves worship. This is the crux of Islam that we recognize no multiple creators or no multiple objects of worship, but rather the one who is the true, who deserves it, who is the creator of the entire universe and gave us all these faculties we are talking about with our eyes, our hearing, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is the priority for every single person to recognize. He also recognizes that the creator obviously did not just leave us on earth and did not give us guidance. He sent people, messengers, Someone who's going to guide us. How do we do the prayers? Like the, what I've just demonstrated, right? We didn't just decide, you know what, myself and uh, AK, let's come out with a way that we can make these people pray. No. It was the person who was sent by the Creator to show us how to pray. This is why we know it's the same thing that Jesus, peace be upon him, did. When we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, those who know their Bible a little bit, you know, maybe Sunday school at least. When he got there, what did he say? It says, he fell on his face. And the same thing in the Old Testament, when you look at Aaron and his brother Moses, this is what they did in the tent of prayers. When it comes to Abraham and others, this is what they did in prayer, because this is the format. And this is what the angels as well are doing when they pray. They bow themselves, and they also prostrate to the Creator. So this is actually a divine way of praying, and hence, we as Muslims, we hold it that fast. And it is very, very important. Now, I was saying, the, the, the messengers are sent with that. They are not sent to be worshipped. They are sent to teach people how to worship. And so Muslims recognize that from Adam all the way to Muhammad, peace be upon him, there's been a series of these people who are sent with the message, okay? And showing people how to pray, showing people how to behave themselves, and so on and so forth. So anything else belongs there. You worship one God, you follow the messenger who is sent during your time or during the, the, the era you're living in, okay? Like that, because they come with that which is relevant to the community or the people and the society that they came through during the time of. For example, when Jesus, peace be upon him, when he came, he came to a group of people who had a certain lifestyle and so therefore he had to come with laws and regulations that were relevant to the people of the time. So that's the same thing that happens with Muhammad, peace be upon him. He comes at a time where people are a bit deviant. They are away from worshipping their creator. They have, they have other objects of worship like idols and so forth. One incident which uh, one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to, uh, you know, remember, when he used to be a polytheist, you know dates, right? They used to make their own idol with the dates. And then when he got hungry, he'll start peeling from his God, you know. Start eating him. And he used to laugh at himself. He said, this is what we used to do back then. And, you know, obviously, Islam came and elevated them from that. And many other ills in the society. But this is the point. Every Muslim, he prays 
to the Creator and he follows the way that the messenger taught how to pray. So this is why this becomes the formula for any person who becomes a Muslim. That they recognize the right of the Creator to be worshipped alone and they recognize the one who is their like mentor or their teacher on how to do that worship that they have declared that they want to dedicate to the Creator. Make sense? And we have other matters like fasting, as you know, month of Ramadan. We have also what we have as uh, what is known as zakah, you know, what we give to the poor. For those who are wealthy enough, like our guy, you know, we said he's filthy rich. He still has to spare some of his wealth, you know. May Allah make everyone rich, by the way. Say, I mean, okay, people don't want to be rich. Okay, then, no problem. <laughs> I was making a prayer for you guys to be rich and you all went quiet. Can you imagine? Amazing. People, they don't want to be rich. It's interesting. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to... You, you want to be... <laughs> you want to be rich? I made the prayer. I didn't say amen to it. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> now, then what you have is pilgrimage as well. So the one who's wealthy enough and healthy enough to travel, to go to Mecca, at least once in his lifetime, they have to perform the pilgrimage. This would be typically the five pillars of Islam. The main point we mentioned, which is the right of Allah to be worshipped alone, the Creator, and also for Muhammad to be recognized as the prophet and messenger of God, meaning he's taken as an exemplar on how to worship the Creator and follow his teachings and guidelines. The second one is the prayer which we've just demonstrated. And the third one would be what? The third one would be the issue of fasting in the month of Ramadan. The fourth one would be giving, you know, some of the wealth to the poor people for those who are capable of doing that within the regulations of Islam and pilgrimage. Okay. Now, I, I had these guys sit here for a moment because I wanted to mention something interesting before we can have our Q&A, right? As I said, he could be the top dog of the whole town. He could be like a nobody to anyone, right? And they could have a quarrel from outside, like I said. They could have had issues whatsoever. They cannot dictate that, no, who stands next to me, they must wear the same clothes as me, they must be of the same uh, uh, financial status whatsoever. This doesn't work, right? Now, can you imagine, you are fighting, pulling each other's beard and hair and all of that, but when you are in the prayer, before we conclude the prayer, like we sit in this fashion that I'm sitting in, then after that, we conclude our prayer with a greeting of peace. So we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, which means peace and blessings and the mercy of the Creator be upon you. Meaning, anyone who's on my right, I'm greeting them with the greetings of peace. Even the guy I was fighting. Okay? And then also towards my left, in case he wasn't on my right, he could be on my left. I don't miss him in any case. You understand? So I still declare, you know, the prayer, which is to ask for mercy and blessings and safety and so forth. Now, why I'm mentioning this particular point to conclude, it's because, unfortunately, non-Muslims, they speak for Muslims, and Muslims, they're not given the chance to speak for themselves. And hence, you find a great deal of misconceptions about Islam, like Muslims, they like fighting, you know, they don't like peace and whatnot. We greet each other with peace, we separate in peace, and we pray for each other's peace and whatnot, and yet we are the least peaceful people. Would it make sense to anyone? Everything I say to people, I say, peace be upon you, peace be upon you. Like if, if you were coming one by one, all of you were Muslim, like, peace be upon you, peace be upon you, peace be upon you, peace be upon you. And then yet in my life, I don't have any peace. I don't also even, uh, I mean, advance peace to people. Would that make sense? If my vocabulary is covered day in, day out with greetings of peace, we don't say bye, have a nice day. We say, peace be upon you. Every single time. You come, we say, peace be upon you. You leave, we say, peace be upon you. You step outside, you come back, we say, peace be upon you again, although you were with us just now. You understand? And yet we are not understood to be the people of peace. Why? Because the mouthpiece that speak on our behalf, they don't have good intentions to make you understand what we are. And hence, we hope you find even this experience, this short sitting with you, obviously not very short, because I've been going on, right? <laughs> but I hope you find it, I mean, to obviously open another door of understanding for you in terms of what we really are. We are all about worshipping our Creator the best way we can and also to treat other people the best way we can because we understand it's a triangular relationship. I cannot have a good relationship with the Creator and at the same time have a messed up relationship with the creation. You understand? And so I can also have a good relationship with the creation but I have a bad relationship with the Creator. This is a messed up setup. So for us, this is the triangle. We have the Creator above, 
and then I have you on the other end, on the other corner of our triangle, and then myself. So it works like that to basically make this whole triangle to work. And we hope everyone also adopts this way of life and they see this as a way of going about things. Because that's the only way you can have harmony, where you have the one in charge and then you have the ones who are under his command, working in collaboration to please their master and at the same time working with each other in a harmonious way. And this is what Islam is all about. And with that being said, I ask Allah to forgive me for any mistakes I may have made and also ask him to guide each and every one of us and those who want to be rich to make them rich. Even, yes, and those who also want to be healthy because there's a lot of ways of being rich. Even contentment of the heart, this is the true richness. And it can only be attained when you have this synchronicity with reality, which is you didn't bring yourself here, and also you, like no one else could actually take you away from here except the one who brought you here in the first place. And with that being said, I'm open to questions. Wa sallallahu wa ala nabira Muhammad. Very good question. How do you know a person is a messenger? Right? She's saying, how do you know that this person is truly a messenger of God? So what the Creator has been doing from time to time is that he gives the messenger also signs, for example, whether it could be certain uh, miracles as well as the truth that he speaks. Because one thing that you will always identify with every messenger, they call people to the worship of the Creator alone. They do not call to themselves, they do not enrich themselves through that, and they do not advance to authority and power. They are not power greedy or anything like that. And they are not manipulative. So they are known from, before even they are given the duty of being messengers, they are known for being truthful and honest and people of integrity. This is why a messenger would not typically be identified by people who do not know him for a power of soap. He would initially be recognized by his people because he has to be seen and observed that this is an upright person. So they will have a very upright and, and, and very, uh, I would say, impressive, impeccable character you will have in them. You will also notice their speech. If not, they are truthful in their speech. Typically, that's one of the items. And then, obviously, the miracles after that. The miracles are not the top aspect of it because you have magicians as well that can do something that typically looks like a miracle, isn't it? Because a miracle is that which sort of contradicts, you know, the laws of nature and how things usually go about, Okay. But these people, from their character, from their truthfulness, as well as what the Creator aids them with, and the crux of their message is always worship the one who created you. And this is one of the things that you can. But obviously you have to dig in a bit more with some because it's, it's not always identical. But one thing that is fundamental with them is them being truthful, is them being impeccable character. They are not known for any bad behavior or actions or manipulation or lies or, you know, all those kind of things, as well as their, I would say, uh, I would say their obsession with the right of the Creator to be observed, which is that you worship the Creator alone without any partners. You don't worship me. You don't do anything like that. They don't call people to themselves. They call them to the Creator. That's one of the things I can basically uh, give you in this particular instance. Sorry? What is written there? It says, La ilaha illallah. Al-Malikul Haqq al mubin which means there is none worthy of worship in truth except Allah, the Master, and who is the, the manifest truth as well, meaning the true Master, and who is the manifest truth. al haqq al mubin means the manifest truth, meaning even if you don't see him, but it's very apparent that he exists and is there. For example, and he's Al-Malik, meaning he owns everything, everything belongs to him. That's what is here. Other phrases would be obviously different. We have phrases because we do not have any depiction of the Creator. So what you can have, like if you see those circles there at the top, these are the names and attributes of the Creator. This is what we know him by, what he has defined himself with, or the messenger, peace be upon him, defined him by. Whether he says he's the most merciful, the most kind, I've noted you, and then, uh, then I'll, I'll come to you, right? The most kind, the most merciful, and so on and so forth. This is the only way we can actually decorate. That's why you didn't see any animate object in the mosque. From the time you came in from there, all the way inside. Because we are pure monotheistic, monotheistic people, we do not make any depictions of the Creator whatsoever. We only know Him by His names and attributes and His actions that are unique to Him as the Creator. Okay? Yes, Lee. Sorry? Which one? These ones here. This is a whole verse, actually. It's telling us about the Creator. This is verse 255 of the second chapter of the Quran, which says that... Uh, it starts by Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is typically what we begin with, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. It says, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum, 
لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسي السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم. These are nine phrases that are telling us about the Creator. That there is no one worthy of worship besides him. He is the, like you know, the one who is self-sufficient. And it mentions that everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to him. He says no one can intercede with him except through his permission and will. As well as he does not get tired from actually facilitating it. As well as he knows what is before it and what is after it. And he is obviously the most high, the most great. I'm just paraphrasing what the verse is about. So this is actually a part of the verse of the Quran. And uh, it's telling us, defining the creator to us so we know him better by those terms or those phrases. Yes. How long does it take you to learn, I think it's Arabic. Arabic. Arabic yeah. It's going to be very difficult for me to answer that because I learned in a very informal way. So it's quite, I think it, it varies with the people of how really quickly they are good with languages and so forth. But I, I think in a year you'd have a good hang of Arabic, you know. Yeah, in a year you can. If you have like, you know, obviously a proper structure that is consistent, then I, I'm sure in a year you'd have a very good command of the Arabic language. Maybe you'd advance more because Arabic has the issue of grammar and, and matters like that. Yes. No, to be a Muslim, you have to recognize the right of the Creator to be worshipped alone and to recognize the right of the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet and messenger, the one who deserves to be followed in our day and age. But yes, you do need Arabic in a sense when it comes to other matters in other aspects eventually. But to be a Muslim, you recognize to understand these two points I've just made. Okay? So meaning, like myself, I'm Zulu. I didn't have to first learn Arabic before I can then say, okay, I understand what Islam is about, then I can do it. It, ca it becomes necessary, though, to fulfill other aspects of Islam eventually. But to be a Muslim, you can be a Muslim with your English and your Zulu and your Sutu and Francais, because I had someone speaking French, you know, so <laughs> all of that, okay? This is where we keep the Quran, copies of the Quran or any other reading material that we typically use in the mosque. You see, like, because the Quran, we, we keep some copies of it. Part of our remembrance of the Creator is that we recite the Quran. This is called dhikr. We recite it. I've noted you. I'll come to you, right? We, we recite the Quran, and this is a form of worship in and of itself as well. So we keep copies of it inside and uh, for anyone who wants to come in the mosque and sit and read. If you see this, those uh, stompy tables as well, right? So if you sit it like that, then you can place it on that and you can go ahead and read, okay? Do we have a specific dress code? The answer is yes. The dress code for the men is that they are supposed to, if they are going to be public or anything like that, or getting exposed to other people who are not from their family, that they have to cover from the navel to the knee. Typically, that's the minimum, right? For the ladies, it's the entire body except the face and the hands. When we say covered, meaning it does not define your structure. It does not define the shape of uh, some of your limbs or anything like that. Whatever that needs to be covered, it should be very difficult for other people to actually see. You miss one, for example, from the five. It depends on the reason you missed it, right? If you missed it on purpose, then unfortunately you've basically sinned and that's it, right? If you did it on purpose, meaning you totally ignored the time and you were aware, but the excuses that you have is either forgetting or maybe you overslept, especially for the one in dawn. Usually you may oversleep or anything like that, didn't hear the alarm or anything like that. So what you do is you make up for it, meaning you are owing it. So when you wake up, then you can make up for that. Because same thing with the one you forgot. The one you forgot, the time you remember is the best time to also make up for it. But if you left it intentionally, you just basically were lazy about it, then really you can't make up for that one. Because you did it intentionally, meaning you decided to go against the rule, you know, in that sense. Because going to Mecca is, is on condition that you can afford it and you are healthy to do so. And for a lady, an additional clause is that if you have someone, a male figure, to accompany you. Right. In Islam, a, la a lady is someone who is a royalty because she cannot, she has to be escorted type of a situation. You know? Yeah. So if you don't have someone, you could have the wealth, you could have the health but you do not have someone to escort you who is allowed to escort you, then in that case, this, this obligation is lifted off you. You understand? Until those conditions are met, then it becomes a must. 
Okay? This one here. Yes, so this is known as a mimbar. Mimbar is an elevated platform. This is what the imam or the one who gives the speech or who gives the sermon typically has to stand on. And this is what the Messenger وسلم, used to do. Peace be upon him. He had an elevated platform known as the mimbar and he would stand on it. And so this would typically be one of those. So if I may, I'd be standing over here and so obviously I, 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 I stand tall and you definitely I command some kind of attention, isn't it? Okay, so back in the days when they didn't have sound system, this would be a good sound, uh, this thing, enhancer, you know. That, like, you, that's why you see the structure like concaving into the wall. It was mostly for amplifying the voice of the imam so that everyone can hear him, you know. Today we have the mic system. And so you have obviously when they, they were built, it has become now a tradition kind of a thing that it carries over, even though we don't necessarily need it that much. I want to demonstrate to you just now. If I'm, if I'm talking into this, my voice is a bit, you know, it bounces back and then it goes back to the people. So like the imam would be here, Allahu Akbar, then everyone can hear him, you understand? So this would be uh, another trick to basically raise the guy's voice a bit more so that everyone can hear him. Other than that, well, it looks cool too to have it over here. Okay, so you typically have about 15 to 20 minutes to address the people, and then you have about five minutes. It's, it's, it never, it hardly goes beyond 30 minutes. I think that's the longest people can, can actually, I mean, spend when it comes to the time for prayers. Because other than the other prayers, it's just performing the prayer, and that's it, which is like five to seven minutes or 10 minutes or so. So you typically have him speaking for like 15, 20 minutes, and then after that, you will have him then obviously lead the prayer, which is another five minutes. So you have like 25 to 30 minutes or so. That would be the, long, the longest I have quite seen. And what is the word for the call to prayer? Twisting things up right now, isn't it? The word for the call to prayer, it begins with an A, yes? Adhan, yes, very good. Awesome. And I also said, the person who leads the prayer has a, a term. I think this one will remember first. Yes, she went for it right away before I finish. It's the imam, right. And I mentioned as well, I said to you, we face a particular direction. And what is that direction? We face the direction of, of towards Mecca. Yes, we face towards Mecca. And uh, how many units of prayer are a must for a Muslim to observe? Let me see. Yes, ma'am. No, the prayers are five, but the units, yes, 17. The prayers are five, but the units, they add up to 17 in all the five prayers because each prayer has about a number of units, okay? So no one is wrong in that sense because we talk about the prayers in any sense. Okay, and um, let me see, what else did I mention? Okay, I said, what is the reason why we do not have any animate objects in the mosque or anything like that of any living entities? Yes? Yes, so because Allah is not seen, in, he's not depicted, he hasn't been seen by anyone, and therefore he doesn't have some kind of a representation of him, and hence we cannot depict, you know, because this is where you have idolatry come in, where people are trying to express how they think the creator ought to look like, or anything like that, and this is definitely unacceptable. Okay? Right. Well, I guess that's, that's our time. And I uh, thank you for coming through. I hope you enjoyed this experience. And I hope you don't forget much of what we spoke about as well. Okay? And you can share it with others. Okay? Cool. Let's move.